I was delivering and installing machines. Since I was behind schedule, I decided to drive late to my next destination. There were no street lights and or other cars. At the peak of feeling like I was in the middle of nowhere, every single light on the dashboard on my truck lit up. Then it stalled. Now it's pitch black. I am stopped and the truck isn't starting. I shut everything down and started making phone calls. I looked up and saw something move in the front of my truck, just out of distance of my hazard lights. I finally got a hold of someone and they told me it would be at least two to three hours before they could get a mechanic out for me. So now I'm just sitting in silence. The only noise is the clicking the hazard lights are making. As I'm staring out the windshield into a void of darkness, I see movement again. So I throw on my high beams. The headlights caught three wolves snacking on something that looked like roadkill. I honked the horn and they looked at me like they were more irritated than scared. The wolves more than likely weren't going to bother me, but it was just spooky knowing that they were there. So again I shut my lights off. I suddenly heard what I can only equate to a woman's scream of terror. It sounded like it was coming right from behind the truck. And something slammed into the side of the truck, hard enough to rock it. I turned every light on and laid on the horn, I was checking both of my mirrors, and the only thing I saw was a shadow bolt across the road. I noticed that the wolves were now gone. From every nature documentary I've ever watched, the only time predators leave food is when there are bigger predators around. I could hear whatever it was thrashing around in the bush nearby, breaking sticks and what sounded to be logs. I basically had the steering wheel gripped all the lights on and was feverishly looking out every single window and through the mirrors to make sure nothing was around the immediate area of the truck. Finally, I saw some headlights through one of my mirrors. The noises stopped as the headlights approached. It was obviously the mechanic I'd called earlier. He pulled out in front of me. My headlights were shining on his truck. As his door opened to step out, both then heard that same scream again that I had heard earlier and the brush thrashing intensified. He closed his door immediately, and my phone rang. He called my phone, asking me what the hell that was, and he sounded more panicked than I did. I told him I have no clue what it was, and neither did he, so the mechanic ended up calling the police. We waited for a while, then two state police officers showed up. They lit that area up like a stadium. That's when I finally stepped out of the truck for the first time since it all began. We heard that scream three more times while the mechanic was working on my truck. Thankfully, they were getting further and further away. The cops had no idea what it was either, and they looked kind of spooked too. The mechanic finally got my truck running, and I made it to a hotel for the night. The next morning, when I went out to my truck, I saw where I'd been hit. There was an indentation about the size of a basketball, maybe seven feet off the ground. I have no idea what that was, and I probably never will. I do confidently know that I'll never ever drive through the Upper Peninsula at night again. I service fire equipment, so I drove a box truck, and I was in rural northwest Pennsylvania, returning from a service call and heading towards the interstate to go home. On the way out to this customer, I saw a small pickup truck on the interstate, whose right rear tire was steadily deflating. About a mile or so before my exit, they pulled off to the side. I didn't stop to see if they needed help, and I felt a little bad about it. As I drove down this dark, twisty road, I passed a Dodge Durango that was pulled over into a barn driveway. There was a person lying on the ground behind it, struggling with something. It looked like a guy was trying to change a tire or get the spare out from underneath the Durango. Remembering the pickup I saw from earlier, I decided to turn around and see if he needed help. I pulled into the first driveway I saw, about a quarter mile down the road, turned around, and headed back. A halfway back, the Durango passed me, going in the same direction I had originally been headed. I get back to where I'd seen that Durango, planning to turn around again. But as I swung into the driveway, my headlights caught a figure, lying motionless in the snow. I stopped and jumped out just as the figure sat up. It was a woman, maybe in her 40s, in a thin, torn black skirt and top. Her hair was messed up, her eye was starting to swell, and she had red marks on her throat, and her lip was bleeding. 
I helped her up and got her into my truck and cranked up the heat. I had taken my jacket off and given it to her, and she covered her torso and her arms. She didn't want to say anything, though. Her throat was sore, and she was badly frightened. So I just called 911, and they dispatched a police car. I gave her a bottle of water, and she whispered thank you, then sat with her head bowed and eyes closed. It took about 15 minutes for the police car to get there, and she stayed silent the whole time. As the car pulled in, she said mostly to herself, He's gonna arrest me. The trooper walked in and motioned me to exit, asked her if she needed an ambulance, which she declined, then asked me what happened. I explained what I'd seen. He wrote everything down, then talked to her for a few minutes. He helped her out of the truck and into his car. She quietly thanked me for coming back, because she thought that guy meant to kill her. As far as I know, she wasn't arrested, but she was pretty beaten up and the trooper spoke and handled her as if she were the victim of an assault. It was almost certainly a transaction that had gone badly. Fortunately, I never found out what had happened. I watched the news outlets for that area for quite a while after this, but never, ever saw anything about it. Back when I was a solo driver, I was making a delivery in Memphis, Tennessee. The receiver kept me there for so long that my clock ran out, and I had to go to West Memphis to get the TA Petro to park for my 10-hour reset. When I got there, I had to park in the very back and very dark part of the lot. I took my dog, Noodles, out to the restroom. While I was walking him, I saw a man at the back of a trailer just standing there. He made me nervous, so I hurried my pup and rushed him back to the truck. After I got out of the truck and started walking to the store so I could get myself some dinner. While I was walking, I heard footsteps behind me. When I turned to look, it looked like the same man I would seen earlier behind the trailer. And he walked right behind me the entire time. No matter what route I took, he seemed to follow me. It was really starting to freak me out, but I wasn't scared just yet. When I got inside, I found the store was packed and so was the restaurant. So I went in, got a seat at the bar before it could be taken. I ordered my food and waited for it to come. Halfway through my dinner, my bladder reminded me that I needed to use the bathroom. So I told the waitress I wasn't finished, I just had to go to the bathroom and that I would be back. When I got back to my plate, my fork was on the right side of my plate. When I looked around, I didn't see that man that followed me inside, but I was now scared. I'm left handed. I always put my utensils on the left side of my plate. Something was done to my food. I called the waitress over, still standing behind my chair, and asked if she messed with my food. She declined. I asked her if she saw anyone else mess with it. and She said she was too busy, but she didn't see anybody. So she went and got the manager. I told the manager about that creepy man that had been following me around, and then followed me into the store, then disappeared when I entered. He got me a new meal and moved me to a seat closest to the office. He went into the office and came back out a few minutes later, sat down in the booth across from me. He said, I looked through the camera feed, and a man did indeed come to where your food was while you were gone. He put something into your mashed potatoes. He stirred it, and then left back outside of the building. We don't have any cameras outside of the truck lot, so I don't know exactly where he went. I don't want you to leave the store alone. I also need to report this to police. Do you mind if I call them? I told him no, I don't mind. So I sat there and finished my meal and thanked him as he brought me a piece of pie on the house. When the police came to take a report and search the ground for the man, they didn't find him. After a few hours in total, the police officer told me that he would drive me back to my truck. He also told me that he was going to speak to his boss and ask if they could post a police officer out there all night to watch for that man. The boss man allowed it, and the entire night there's a police officer parked in the deepest, darkest part of that lot, keeping watch. I appreciated it immensely. Unfortunately, the man was never caught, but thankfully nothing bad happened to me or anyone else that night. I'm so thankful to those police officers still to this day, and even though it's been a few years back now. I'm 
17 years old and I'm currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. The incident I'm going to tell you about took place about six months ago on an overnight trip to the Superstition Mountains, which were about an hour drive east of Phoenix. I'm not going to specify the exact trail because I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize what happens when you post stuff on the internet, whether it's a good trail, an abandoned mine, ghost, or whatever it may be. People come flocking, and usually with a lot of trash and loud music. So anyway, this particular trail I was taking was an 8 mile loop through the canyon. Pretty simple in and out and an overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friends, but a last minute cancel on his part left me on my own. So, with a packed bag, a car ready, I decided to go. Not leaving the house on time, unfortunately. Some trouble navigating through some rough forest roads landed me at the trailhead around 5.45 p.m., which for those of you who don't backpack is a very big no-no. I had about a four-mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot, and it was getting dark fast, but I figured if I moved quick enough, I could at least get two to three miles in before I had to find a spot. This strategy left me hiking a very dark trail on my own with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anyone else. Hiking in the dark itself is scary, especially where I was being on my own. Eventually, it got so dark that the only thing I could see where my headlamp was pointing at, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and get my camp set up. With only using the headlamp as my light source and trying to move fast, I ended up in a less than ideal spot but there were some burnt pieces of wood and the remains of a fire circle, so it looked like people had been there before, but definitely not recently. My first priority was to get a fire going. I scanned the area around me and was able to find some dry wood and got it going. I got my tarp set up and cracked open a can of chili mac that I brought for myself, which I was very much looking forward to eating. I was feeling good now. My camp was set up and my food was now on the fire. The feeling of uneasiness from the hike in had almost gone away, but it was still residing there. To fully understand what happened, I have to explain to you how my camp was set up. The site I had picked was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees with a trail about 30 feet on my left. When you're in the woods and have a fire going, the fire casts a circle of light around it, and everything on the edge of that circle past it is pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire eating my dinner when a small rock about the size of a marble was thrown into my camp. I looked at the tiny rock in shock as I was positive that I was the only person on this trail that night. I immediately turned on my light toward that area where I'd seen the rock come from, but due to the density of the pines and brush, I could maybe see only about 10 feet in front of me. I spent the next 15 minutes in total disbelief. As I scanned the tree line that surrounded me, searching for what or whoever had thrown that rock, although not daring to stray too far from my fire, that in hindsight offered me a false sense of security. After sitting back down and spending the rest of the night on high alert, I was able to convince myself finally that I had somehow kicked the rock, or maybe it had fallen from a tree, as I went to go to sleep, not expecting the pure terror that was about to unfold. I woke up to the sound of rustling leaves. Barely audible if you weren't listening for them, but they were definitely there. Still in a sleepy daze, I listened as the rustling got harder and harder to hear, as I assumed they were moving further and further away from me. I went to grab my handheld flashlight that I'd left next to me, but the more I looked, the more scared I got as I came to realize that it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag, ducked out of my tarp, and looked around. I was able to see a light off in the woods. It couldn't have been more than 15 feet away. It was my flashlight, lying on the ground in a pile of leaves. This is one of the few moments in my life where I've almost shit my pants. The same flashlight that I left lying next to me when I'd fallen asleep just a few hours ago was now 15 feet away from me past the tree line in the woods. I hurriedly slipped on my boots, clutching my knife in the other hand and keeping my head on a swivel. I quickly weighed my options. Stay here and wait out the night, or attempt a three mile hike back in the dark. I figured that whatever or whoever was out there with me was definitely going to have a better advantage if I was out on the trail without a light. I decided it was a better idea to stay at the camp and wait out the night. Eventually, whatever it was came back. I could hear it out there, walking through the woods. It was far off, but I could definitely still hear it. It just sounded like someone leisurely walking by, like they were out on a stroll without a care in the world. 
Sometimes it would walk too far away, and I would lose the sound of its steps. But then, an hour or so later, maybe two, it would return. Still faint, but definitely there. This went on for about three or four hours until I listened to the steps get closer and closer. Until they were only maybe less than ten feet from me. At this point, the fire had gotten very small, as I'd run out of wood in my pile. As those footsteps stop, everything else went totally silent. I sat there, completely still for two hours, clutching a knife in my hand and prayed that I wouldn't hear anything else. I stayed like that until the sun cast enough light that I could see that I was alone in my campsite. I packed up my things and speed walked those three miles back down the trail I'd taken. I arrived at a dirt road where my car was parked and nearly sprinted to it as I unlocked my Subaru, jumped in and drove and didn't stop until I'd put at least 20 miles between me and that place. I stopped at a local gas station in Apache Junction just to buy a Red Bull, but mostly just to see or talk to another person. As I exited the store, I was able to read what was written in the dust on the back window of my car. Sleep well? A lot of weird things have happened to me on my various adventures through Arizona, but this is by far the weirdest and scariest, so I thought I'd share it. There is seriously a deranged person living in the Superstition Mountains. Do yourself a favor and stay far, far away from those mountains. This encounter happened many, many years ago. I was very young. It was 2001 or 2002, and I was 11 or 12 at the time. My uncle was interested in purchasing some land near Red Oak, Oklahoma. I do not know exactly where, but it was several acres in a very remote area. My father, mother, and myself decided to accompany him one Saturday to scope out that property. From our home, it was a little more than a three-hour drive, but we all loved riding in the car, so while it was not going to be the most eventful road trip we ever had, we just all wanted to get out of the house. Upon arrival, I remember being underwhelmed by the place. No houses anywhere, and hardly even any signs of life apart from a few birds. The wooden area isn't exactly what I would call picturesque. Still, we parked our car off the road to go explore the woods a little. My uncle was talking about buying the land for hunting. Not really my cup of tea. As we walked through those woods, it was a very nice day. But still, something felt off. Everyone in our group, every single person, remarked about the eerie feeling. But my dad and uncle seemed to laugh it off. My mom had goosebumps and kept looking over her shoulder, which made me on edge too. She was very insistent that it was weird, that she wanted to leave, saying it felt like she was being watched. After a bit of hiking, I noticed that there was a small red building. I've seen bigger storage sheds in the suburbs, but it looked well built. My uncle said there was nothing about it on the listing, so we went to peek inside. The door was open, and inside, there were open cans of food, a ratty blanket on the floor, and it stunk, unlike anything I'd ever smelled before. Following this discovery, we all agreed it would be best to get back in the car, especially if there was some crazy hermit living in those woods. We didn't want to be around when he came back. The only issue, we had walked pretty far into the woods at this point, and now weren't exactly sure which direction was the correct one to go to. That eerie feeling continued to amp up, and we were now all on edge. We ended up trekking another mile before we finally found the road. But we were further down from where we'd parked the car, but at least we could just follow the road now. Walking along the road, we came across a truly unsettling sight. Right in the middle of the asphalt was a dark gray cat, on fire. No idea why there was just a random cat out in the middle of the woods. And this obviously had just happened, but there was no one in sight. So naturally, we ran the rest of the way back to the car. There was now a huge scratch in the paint all the way down it, from the hood to the trunk. Thankfully, that was the only damage, and my dad was able to start it without any trouble, and we drove away as fast as we possibly could. My heart sped up just recounting this event. It was definitely the most scariest of my life. Needless to say, my uncle did not buy that land, and I'll always remember this terrifying encounter. But like anything over time, I sort of pushed it to the back of my mind, and it just became one of those odd moments you occasionally retell at a family get-together. So much that it's almost a funny story nowadays. The reason I'm sharing this is because I was reminded of it last night while binge watching some episodes of BuzzFeed Unsolved on YouTube. 
when they shared the story about a family that disappeared in that same area while also looking for some land for sale. The disappearance of the Jameson family is the name of the mystery in the video if you're interested. The family died in the same area we were searching, roughly seven years after we made our trip there. There are many theories about their deaths, including the allegations of some sort of cult in the area, complete with something about dead cats. Coincidence? Probably. But that whole story gave me chills. So maybe my family and I narrowly avoided being killed by some witches or a cult. Or maybe we just stumbled upon a hermit who didn't want us in his woods. I worked for a company that owned a Caterpillar D9 bulldozer. It weighed over 100,000 pounds. They had to use a tractor from the 1980s with a drop trailer to move it off the property. Both were functional and as safe as they could be, but had definitely seen better days. They asked me to deliver the bulldozer to another company, and I agreed. We loaded up the dozer, secured it to the trailer, and I was on my way. One of the intersections on the state route is notoriously bad. It's at the base of a hill, and if you're coming up from the side the hill is on, you don't see the stoplight or traffic until you get over the peak of the hill. You usually just have plenty of room to stop. As I was approaching this intersection, my CV antenna lit up, and a guy was basically screaming into it for traffic at the peak of this hill to slow down. The problem, however, was that my CB wasn't tuned, and I only caught about every third word. I let off the accelerator when I peaked the hill, mostly because I hated that intersection. I would have had plenty of time to stop even with the road conditions if traffic were normal. Unfortunately, traffic was not normal. There was a fresh, pretty bad accident at the intersection, and traffic had backed up more than halfway up the hill. The accident had just occurred, so there were no emergency services on scene. I now had very little space to stop and a very heavy load. I started downshifting and braking, realizing I was going to be cutting it very close and started to brake harder. I then realized I was hitting large ice patches on the road. The tires were slipping and jerking the tractor around. I heard the fifth wheel clanking. I felt the trailer tugging on the tractor in a weird way. So I looked at my driver's side mirror and didn't see anything, including the dozer. In a panic, I whipped my head around to look out the passenger mirror, and the only thing I saw was the entire side profile of the trailer and dozer. I had made a terrible mistake in letting that trailer get out from behind me. And it was one of those, well, this is it, this is how I die, moments. I was now jackknifing, while still moving, and still trying to slow the truck down while on an icy hill. I was headed for an intersection full of stopped passenger cars, and my truck weighed a lot. By this point, I was fully convinced that I was about to involuntarily murder a bunch of people. I laid on the horn as much as I could, but I was also trying to work the steering wheel and attempt to pretend I had control. Honestly, I hit a point where I basically realized I was just a passenger standing on a brake pedal. I didn't have enough room to correct anything, so I just went all out on that horn. Trailer tires finally heated up to start making a very loud and deep squeal. There were a bunch of people in front of me that got out and ran away from their cars. The truck finally came to a stop within three feet of the last car in the intersection. I could sit on my truck's bumper and easily put my feet up on the car's bumper. The truck stopped with the trailer jackknifed, so I was blocking both lanes and the breakdown lane. I was sweating and shaking from the anxiety. As I was sitting in the now stopped truck, the people who had abandoned their cars were now screaming at me, pointing up the hill. I looked up the hill to see another tractor, but a tank trailer, basically reliving the same thing I had just did, but with much less space to work due to my trailer blocking so much of the road now. I got out of my truck and ran away from it. The second truck slid down, stopped, and parallel parked almost perfectly with my truck. Once his truck stopped, I could see that he was experiencing the same exact thing I was. We were both extremely close to being in terrible accidents. Thankfully, he was pulling a dry tank. I'm pretty sure that's the only reason he was able to stop. He was running a lot lighter than me. By this time, the guy on the CB got through enough truckers at the top of the hill that they basically slowed everyone down. Once the adrenaline wore off, I almost passed out. I have operated a lot of different vehicles in my life, and that situation was easily the scariest operating situation I've ever lived through. I had zero control. And that's the terrifying thing of the situation. That's a bad feeling for any operator. I remember that the people that ran away from their cars were comforting me. 
It's been over 20 years since that incident. I still get the willies when I think about it. Had I not been able to get that truck to stop, I would have ripped through all those passenger vehicles with little resistance. Another 5 miles per hour, or being in a different lane, maybe just a bit more ice, even the time of day would have completely changed the outcome, and I would have been completely at fault. I'm a female living in Sweden, and this happened a few years back when I was around 19 or 20. Me and my then boyfriend, now ex-boyfriend, used to love going on night drives out of the city. We would talk and just listen to music for hours on end. We rarely encountered anything or anyone sketchy on these drives, just the occasional deer or fox crossing the road. This particular night was different, however, and it stuck with me for some reason. So, I lived in a neighborhood pretty close to an area with a high crime rate and gang violence. It was maybe about a mile or so away. The area where I lived was rather calm. Just the occasional drug deal and cop cars patrolling the area. I did and still have the mindset that if you mind your business and don't stick your nose into other people's, you'll be fine. I've also had my fair share of the reasons to not trust the police. However, I watch true crime and listen to these true scary stories on YouTube on the daily. So I'm well aware that some people have the taste for scaring, hurting, and killing others just for the fuck of it. With that being said, I don't snitch, but I will never stand by and watch someone hurt another person without interfering in some way. So back to the story and the night in question. It was nearing midnight. I was sitting on my balcony smoking a cigarette while waiting for my boyfriend to come pick me up for one of our late night drives. My apartment is at the end of a long street, close to a crossing on the left side of the building. Suddenly... I hear what sounded like two gunshots going further off down the street to my right. In my mind, I immediately tried to explain it away as firecrackers or something. I guess my initial reaction to potential danger is to rationalize. But I will admit, my heart started racing a little bit. You could see the whole street from the balcony I was on. And since I didn't see anything or anyone, I went back inside. And then I got dressed and headed back outside to meet my boyfriend. He arrived shortly thereafter. I got into the car and told him about what I just heard. He suggested we make a U-turn and drive down the street just to see if we could spot something. I guess I was hoping to find some kids playing with firecrackers and goofing around so I could just let it go. Instead, we saw a man, bald and maybe in his 30s, holding a plastic bag and closing the trunk of a silver car on one of the smaller parking lots connected to another apartment complex just down the street. He definitely saw us driving past since the street was otherwise empty. Outside of that, nothing really suspicious about it, I guess. My gut, however, was telling me something else. Now, to get out on the main road to get out of the city from where we were, we had to turn around once more and go back down the street toward my apartment to get to the crossing, or drive around the whole block to another crossing, which led to the same main road. We chose to do the latter. This took no more than maybe five minutes, and I was trying to distract myself by talking to my boyfriend to get rid of that uneasy feeling that was in my gut. We get onto the main road after driving for maybe three minutes. We stop by a red light just around the corner from the crossing by my apartment. It was past midnight now, and we were the only car on that road. We had gotten the music going, and as I looked out the window to my right, there's the same bald man from earlier with the plastic bag in his hand. He's walking on the sidewalk leading up to the pedestrian crossing by the red light, when he sees our car and sees me through the window. He stops dead in his tracks puts his thumb in the air like he's a hitchhiker. The car is only standing still for maybe 30 to 40 seconds, but I swear this moment felt like minutes. As I'm having this weird eye contact with the man, I tell my boyfriend, who also looks out the window and sees him, and I say, Dude, that's the same guy we saw in the parking lot. Why the fuck is he hitchhiking? For the record, there are three bus stops in the immediate area with buses and traffic, going 24-7 in all directions. There's also sidewalks leading to the train station, which would only be a 10 minute walk from where we were. The man doesn't seem to be living on the street, since he's wearing some sort of branded tracksuit with clean, expensive looking sneakers. And I literally just saw him buy a car, which I can only assume he has the keys to since he closed the trunk himself and no one else was in sight. And like I said, we were the only car on that side of the road. These thoughts are racing through my mind. 
making the situation all the more strange. Well, my body is on high alert, and this guy is not breaking eye contact. His face is completely expressionless. Maybe it was the lighting from the lamppost and the fact that it was dark out, but those eyes just felt black. It was fucking eerie. He still has his thumb in the air and the bag in the other hand. And now, he's slowly walking up to the car from the sidewalk. I'm now about to shit my pants because there's absolutely zero reason for this guy to be hitchhiking in the middle of the street by a red light, when there are plenty of other means of transportation close by. And it's the middle of summer. It's not like there's a storm or something, weather-wise, that he needs to immediately shelter himself from. And the way he just stopped dead in his tracks when he saw our car? Fuck no. This dude is up to no good. And my gut is letting me know about it. After what felt like forever, the light turns green, just as this guy is about to open up our passenger side door. My boyfriend floors it out of there, and I'm freaking the fuck out. That thing they say about how your body can literally sense when you're in the presence of someone evil? Yeah, that's absolutely true. This wasn't my first or last time experiencing it, but it was definitely one of the more memorable ones. Although nothing technically actually happened, it's all the facts surrounding it that makes it totally bizarre. The supposed gunshots, the closing of the trunk, the plastic bag, and the fact that he started hitchhiking out of nowhere when you could literally see a bus stop from across the road where we were. I can admit to being somewhat of an overthinker, and at that point in my mind, we had just encountered a person who robbed and shot someone, put whatever items he stole into the plastic bag, got rid of the gun and maybe even the body in the trunk of said robbed person's car. They needed a quick way out of there before the cops showed up. As we're now speeding down the highway, I'm hyperventilating and relaying this theory to my boyfriend. I can tell he's a bit freaked out himself, but far from as panicked as I was. He pretty much talked some sense into both of us, saying that the alleged gunshots were probably firecrackers, or the cops would have already been there. Maybe the guy just picked something up from his own car and was drunk or tweaking or something, and then therefore couldn't drive himself. In that state of mind, he may have thought that randomly hitchhiking in the middle of a desolate road with one car on it late at night when there are bus stops and walkways to use was a perfectly reasonable thing to do, and that was a good enough reason for me not to call the cops. I did keep a close eye on the news via my phone for the rest of the night and the day after, just to see if any crimes were reported in the area, but nothing ever came up. We also didn't see any cop cars or ambulances speeding in that direction, or in any direction for that matter, the entire time we were driving. I'm thinking that someone would have called the emergency services if the sounds I heard actually were gunshots, since there are people living in the apartments surrounding that whole street and that area. Or maybe... Nobody bothered, and there's a corpse rotting in the trunk of that silver car to this day. I did see that car every day, still parked in that same spot for months afterwards, so who knows. I'm just happy that guy didn't get to us before we drove off, because murderer or not, his vibe was not it. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around to this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Instagram, and you can also stalk me on Facebook. All these links are below. What's going on everybody? Um... Originally, I <laughs> meant to this episode, <clears throat> oh my god, I can't talk already. I meant this episode to be a truck stop, truck stop, oh my, like I just told you, I can't talk. A trucker story episode. I had like two trucker stories, I had like two road trips, to, uh, <laughs> I can't fucking talk right now. I had a few trucker stories, I had a few road trip stories, and I had a few other random stories. And then I got a really good uh, user submission uh, story this morning in my email, so I'm like, you know what, fuck it, it's just gonna be another true scary stories, true horror stories episode, and squish it all together, and this is what you get. So hopefully that's cool, I know I think a lot of you preferably like the true care- 
oh my god, Drew Carey? <laughs> the true Carey stories, and the true scary stories, and the true horror stories, instead of just the theme stories, whatever. So, yeah, this is what you get, this is what you get. I really want to get back and play Sons of the Forest, and I also have a screaming, upset toddler upstairs right now who got put to bed early because he keeps pooping his pants and won't poop on the potty. I know you don't care about that, but good lord. It's uh, beyond frustrating. So, with all that being said, uh, make sure that you take your... I don't know. I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. Make sure that you live, love, laugh, and live, love, live, and drive fast and eat ass, okay? I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers.